Welcome to lecture 7.3, the heat and wave equations in higher dimensions. There are three fundamental PDEs in Rn that we've seen. There's Laplace's equation, which is Laplacian of u equals zero. There's the heat equation, which is ut equals c squared Laplacian u, and the wave equation, which is utt equals c squared Laplacian u. In this lecture, we will solve the heat and the wave equation subject to various boundary conditions. Now you can certainly have different boundary conditions, Dirichlet, Neumann, mixed, etc., on both the heat and the wave equation and also homogeneous and inhomogeneous boundary conditions on these. But I'm going to argue that at least when you're starting out, it's more natural to have these unusual boundary conditions on the heat equation than the wave equation. For example, if you have a square region, maybe this represents the temperature in a room. Maybe you're looking at a top view or almost top view. So this is X and this is Y. Then it, it, it's natural to think about maybe a few heaters. Maybe there's a heater along one side of the room or there's a window on the other side. This is a situation when you have inhomogeneous boundary conditions. You can also have non Dirichlet conditions. If, if this is completely insulated, then you have Neumann boundary conditions. Now for the wave equation, you can certainly impose inhomogeneous boundary conditions. That would happen if, if this drum or this vibrating membrane were not, did not have a flat um, boundary. For example, if you take that coat hanger example that we saw in the previous a couple of lectures, I forget how earlier in a recent lecture, and we try to make a drum out of this and this thing were vibrating, yeah, then this would certainly be the wave equation with inhomogeneous boundary conditions, but it, I would say this is less natural physically, at least starting off, maybe in, in nanotechnology or biology or advanced material research. Maybe this is more natural. I don't know that. But, but at least in an undergraduate class, in my mind, when I'm thinking about modeling, inhomogeneous boundary conditions are more natural on the heat equation. And similarly, uh, Neumann boundary conditions are more natural as well, because that corresponds to insulation. What does it mean if, if we have Neumann boundary conditions on the wave equation and, and the, the rate of change is not passing through the boundary. Well, for, for most things like a vibrating membrane or a vibrating string, the boundary is fixed. That's a very natural interpretation of Dirichlet conditions. Okay, now if you want to, you, you can Google Neumann boundary conditions wave equation, you'll get a ton of results. So I don't wanna say that these don't exist or it's not possible. I'm just gonna say that at least in an undergraduate class, I think it's more natural to have homogeneous Dirichlet conditions for the wave equation. We will solve the heat equation first. So to solve a boundary and initial value problem for the heat equation in two dimensions, that's just ut equals c squared uxx plus uyy, we take the following steps. First, we will find the steady state solution. So this happens when ut is equal to zero. So to do that, we have to solve Laplace's equation with the same boundary conditions. Now, if your boundary conditions are zero, whether they're Dirichlet or Neumann, this is really easy. Just zero is the solution. So just think about the, the heat equation on a square region where the endpoints are fixed at zero. You don't even need to do that step here. So th this amounts to finding a particular solution. Think about when we solved ODEs. If the equation is homogeneous, sure, zero is a particular solution, but you don't think that way. You just skip the step and solve it. And the second step, or the first step, if you just skip this one, is solve the related heat equation with homogeneous boundary conditions. Then we add these two functions together to get the final solution. That's u of x, y, t equals the steady state solution of x and y, and the solution to the related equation with homogeneous boundary conditions. Here's a picture of this. Let's suppose that we wanna solve the heat equation on a square region with inhomogeneous boundary conditions. So here's a picture of that. This is the same thing that we saw when we studied Laplace's equation. And let's suppose that the initial condition here is something wild and crazy. So, so it's, some, I don't know, something like, like this, this big surface. Now what's gonna happen over time? So over time, heat's gonna dissipate, this thing will flatten out, and what we will get is the steady state solution, which is the harmonic function on this boundary. 
So let me try to, to sketch that. So it's this soap bubble solution. That's how I like to think of it anyways. So this is the steady state solution. It's not changing over time. It's fixed. What we want to find is we want to find the solution to the heat equation. So that's so this blue curve maybe is the initial condition, u of x, y, 0. And then over time, this is going to die out. So what we have to do is we have to solve the related equation. So instead of solving it with these boundary conditions, solve it with zero boundary conditions. Now let's see if I can actually sketch this. So with the same initial, well, almost the same initial condition. You take the initial condition and you subtract off the steady state solution. And I'm going to call this uh of x, y, t. So to find this solution, you have to find the steady state solution, and then you got to solve this. And that's what we're going to do today. Our first example is solving the following initial and boundary value problem. Sometimes we write this as b slash ivp for short for the two-dimensional heat equation. So the boundary conditions are all going to be zero, Dirichlet, and then we have this initial condition right here. So let me try to sketch this. So this is a square region, and x goes in that direction, say, and y goes in that direction. So this is zero, zero, and this is pi, pi. I'm going to do what we've done in the previous few lectures. We've spent enough time in Fourier series dealing with arbitrary lengths, L, and you get this n pi x over L instead of just n x. And it makes things messier, but you can deal with it in the 1D case. And in the 2D case, I want to simplify things. It's going to be messy enough so you can really see what's important and not get cluttered with these pi over Ls all over the place. Okay, so the temperature along this region or along the boundary is fixed at zero. And then we have this initial condition I'm not going to, I'll try to draw it, but it's, this is, it's, it's going to be very wavy in, and then it's going to be negative for part of this as well. Um, and then as time goes on, this thing is going to just flatten out and approach a steady state solution of zero. Okay, let's solve this. So we're going to use the same method that we use for all of these, separation of variables. We will assume that u of x, y, t is a, f or that there is a function, or there is a solution of the form f of x, y times g of t. In other words, a function of position times a function of time. And we're going to plug these things back in. So let's take derivatives. So u, t is, is equal to f times g prime, and, well, this I'm going to write as c squared times the Laplacian of u. So the Laplacian of u, this is the Laplacian of f times g. If you don't like that as much, then notice this is just f x x g plus f y y times g. So you factor out a g and you get the Laplacian of f times g. Okay, let's use these zero boundary conditions now. So let's write the zero boundary conditions. So the first one is u of zero y t is f of zero y times g of t, and that equals zero. And what can we conclude? Well, this is a non-zero function of time, and we're multiplying it by this. This is a function of y, but th this could be zero. Like if the function were like x times y, and we plug in x equals zero, then we will get zero. So this can be zero, and it has to be zero because the product is zero. So we get right away that f of zero y equals zero. Now we have three more of these. I'm not gonna do all of them out. So I'm just gonna say three more boundary conditions lead us to conclude that f of pi y and f of x zero and oops i didn't mean to 
and f of x pi are all equal to zero. So these are our boundary conditions for f. Okay, now let's let's actually plug this back into the PDE right here. So plug back in, and if we do that, we get that ut is f g prime equals c squared Laplacian of u, which is Laplacian of f times g. Now we'll do what we always do when we have an f and a g here, is divide through by c squared f g. c squared f g. And when you do that, the left-hand side, well, the f's cancel, and the right-hand sides, the g's cancel, and the c squared's cancel. Now don't cancel the f's here, because Laplacian of f, you can't separate that. Okay, so this, you get g prime over c squared g equals Laplacian of f over f. This thing on the left, this is a function of time. It does not depend on position at all. And it's equal to this, this quantity, which depends on function of position. This does not depend on time. So whatever this is, it has to be independent of position and time. It has to be a constant. We'll call it negative lambda. Okay, this is the so-called eigenvalue equation. From this, we get two PD, or we get two ODEs. I'm going to write these down here like I've been doing. So we get the plus. Oops, let me get my pen back. So we get the Laplacian of f equals negative lambda f, and we have these four boundary conditions up here on f. We have f of zero y equals f of pi y equals f of x zero equals f of x pi equals zero. Does that look familiar? This is example one from the previous lecture. This is the Helmholtz equation with the Dirichlet boundary conditions. We just solved this. So if you haven't watched that lecture, please do it. So next, we get the same old equation in G. So we get G prime equals negative C squared lambda G. So we know how to solve this, this first equation. Um, let me do it up here because just in case we run out of room. So we know that lambda is equal to M squared plus N squared. So I'm going to call this lambda M n. That's the eigenvalue of this equation, or of this operator. It's the lambda that works. And the eigenfunction is f m n of x and y equals sine of m x sine of n y. Again, we did that in the previous lecture. Now, we can plug lambda back in for, for lambda here, and we can write g prime equals negative c squared m squared plus n squared times g. And this is just exponential decay. It's the same thing as we saw before, just instead of an n squared here, now we have an m squared plus n squared. So similarly, we go up here and we get that g m n of t equals e to the negative c squared m squared plus n squared t. So this is what we get for our functions f and g up here. So we were looking for a solution of the form f times g. We said if there is one, then, well, there is one for every pair m and n that are positive integers, and they are and they are of this form. Okay, so that means for, for each m and n are natural numbers, whole, whole numbers, whole positive integers, we have a solution u of m n of x, y, t equals f m n of x, y, times g m n of t. And in the interest of clarity, I'm not going to just copy these down. They're right up here. 
But we, we have one of these for each pair M and N. So our general solution is of the form u of x, y, t. This is the infinite sum over all m and n, at least one, up to infinity. You don't have to write the infinity up there if you don't want to. Of So by superposition or linearity, we can add these things together arbitrarily. b, m, n times f. Now I'm just going to write, write down, well, how about if I write down u, m, n, of x, y, t, and that's just m and n. Again, you can write this as a double sum if you want to. I just like this because it's a little more compact notation. So b, m, n times sine of m, x times sine of n, y times e to the minus c squared m squared plus n squared times t. This is our general solution. This the general solution to the boundary value problem. We have not touched the initial condition yet. So this describes every possible solution to the heat equation where the boundary is fixed at zero. For every initial condition, we get a different collection of coefficients. Okay, let's plug in t equals zero. So let's plug in t equals zero and use the initial condition. So u of x, y, zero, what happens? If you plug that in, the exponential goes to one, this goes away. We have this sum from m and n equal at least one of b, m, n, sine of m, x, sine of n, y. So what is this thing? This is, sometimes this is called a 2D Fourier series. It's a sum over all pairs M and N of products of sine of MX, sine of NY. And we have to set that equal to this thing, which is equal to, so this is two sine of X, sine of two Y plus three sine of four X, sine of five y. Okay, so what does that mean? If this infinite, doubly infinite sum is equal to these two terms, the only way that's possible is if like coefficients are equated. So over here, the one, two coefficient, b one, two is two. So that, so let's, so we know that b one, two has to be equal to two. On the right-hand side, we have the four, five coefficient is equal to three. So B, M, N, when M and N is, are four and five, is equal to three. So B, four, five is equal to three. And finally, we, all of the other terms over here are zero. So B, M, N is equal to zero for all, um, let's say otherwise. So if this function right here were not as simple as a 2D Fourier series, we would have to compute a Fourier sine series or a cosine series. And not, what does that mean in a two-dimensional, if we have two x and y? We'll do that with the wave equation. So I specifically split this up. So the first example, we have a very simple thing that we don't have to compute the Fourier sine series of. And the next one, we will have to. And it's not as bad as it, as it seems like it would be. Trust me. Wait and see. Okay, so now we, we are done. We have our, our particular solution and we, we have one place to put it. So let's do that. Let's, let's box off this, this area and let's say the, the particular solution. Um, I like to say the you know, particular solution, dot, dot, dot. You should finish the sentence because any one solution can be a particular solution. So this is the particular solution satisfying the boundary and initial conditions. Or you can say satisfying the initial conditions because we already are coming from this where the boundary conditions are satisfied. So particular solutions, let me say this, sat oops, let me, uh, satisfying the initial condition is, let's do it in red. So u of x, y, 
t. What is it? So it would be wrong to write an infinite sum here because we, we don't need a sum. This is when you have an infinitely many things. We only have two terms. We have two non-zero terms. We only need to write down the one, two term and the four, five term. So let's do that. So you, you have x, y, t. We need to write down this thing for m and n are one and two and four and five. So when let's do the one, two term first. The coefficient b12 is equal to two. So we get two times sine of m is equal to one. So sine of x, sine of two y, and then e to the, what's m squared plus n squared? That's one squared plus two squared. So that's five. So e to the negative five ct. And now let's write down the four five term. What's that? So the four five term, that's the coefficient is three. So that's b four five is three times sine of four x sine of five y and e to the negative. Oh, I forgot my c squared up there. C squared, e to the negative. What's m squared plus n squared? So four squared plus five squared is 16 plus 25. That's 41. So e to the negative 41 c squared t. So this is the final solution to this initial and boundary value problem. Notice what happens over time. So heat dissipates. So when you plug in time equals zero, these go away and you get this initial condition, which is a squiggly thing. But the limit, so this thing here goes to zero as t goes to infinity because these exponential terms are dampers or they, they dissipate, they kill off the waves. And notice that they kill off the waves with a higher frequency faster because e to the five t goes to zero a lot slower than e to the negative 41 t. But these, assuming c is not microscopic, these go to zero pretty darn quickly. So the heat dissipates and that's gonna depend on whether this is metal or plastic or what the thermal conductivity is. But so, um, yeah, that is the heat equation um, with homogeneous boundary conditions. What we will do next, I'm going to tell you before I flash up the equation is now in the next equation, what if we do the same thing, except the boundary conditions look like this. So it's the same three sides, but now the back boundary condition is that thing. So in other words, we are just going to bump up this well, the, the, the short solution is we take this thing and bump it up by that. Then the solution to that is this thing bumped up by whatever the heck this function h of x is. And we actually computed this in the previous lecture or a couple lectures ago. And remember it involved sums of cinches and coshes or sines and cinches, sorry. So yeah, that's, that's the answer to example 1b, which I haven't even showed you yet, which is the same thing, same three boundary conditions, the back one's different, and the initial condition is this thing, but we have to add plus h of x, y. We have to bump it up by this as well. Okay, so that's, that's coming up next. Here's that example that I just told you about and spoiled. So solve the following initial and boundary value problem for the 2D heat equation with inhomogeneous boundary conditions. Same heat equation. Three of the boundary conditions are the same, and this fourth one is this parabola that we've been seeing throughout the class. So if these are the boundary conditions, then the steady state solution is going to be that harmonic function, basically what you get if you make a drum out of this or stick this in into a bucket of soap. So let me try to draw that again so it doesn't look like... something like this. So this is the steady state solution. Let me, let me put an X here. So X goes in that direction. So this is the origin zero, zero. And a couple lectures ago, we actually computed this function. So this, is, when we solved Laplace's equation, we found that this was the infinite sum from N equals one to infinity of four, one minus negative one to the N I know it's a little bit messy, um, pi n cubed 
sinh of n pi. So that was the coefficient times, oops, let me uh, get that a little better, times sine of nx sinh of ny. So this steady state solution, that's what it is right there. Okay, so we are basically bumping up example 1a in the previous slide by this. So we're adding this to the, by bumping up the boundary, we are, have to add it to the initial condition as well. And then as time goes on, these sine waves are going to die out. Okay, so recall what we did in, in the very beginning of this lecture, u of x, y, t is the steady state solution plus the solution to the related homogeneous boundary, or to the related heat equation where there were homogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, so this is example 1a on the previous slide, and we found this in lecture, I think it was 7.1 on Laplace's equation. It's right up here. So we know that the the final solution or the particular solution to this boundary and initial value problem is just, we just add them together. So I'm going to do that. I feel a little bit silly writing this twice, but it doesn't hurt. So let's take the steady state solution and write that down over here. I'm basically copying what I have above times sine of n x times sinh of n y. So this whole thing, and now I have to add those two terms that we had in the previous slide, two sine, so two sine of x sine of y times, oh, hold on, two sine of x sine of two y e to the minus five c squared t plus three sine of four x sine of 5y e to the minus 41 c squared t. So this is our final solution. And now let's go back to what we did with 1D PDEs. Whenever I, remember how I said that solve, that taking the, solving a homogeneous, related homogeneous equation is basically just a change of variables. Well, I claim that, that that's true here as well. So if we wanted to, I could let V of X, Y, T be what you get if you take the solution that I just boxed above, solution to this problem, and I subtract off the steady state solution. If I do that, and then I write this equation in terms of v, so, so clearly vt equals c squared Laplacian of v, so this up here is c squared Laplacian of u, and then clearly these four boundary conditions are, well, well along these three sides we're subtracting off zero, and along the back side we're subtracting off this, so clearly v of zero y t is equal to v of x zero t, which is v of pi y t. These are all zero. And this last one is zero as well because we're subtracting off this curve on the back boundary. So we're just subtracting off there. So v of x pi t equals zero and v of x y zero, if we plug in zero, you get the solution to u and we subtract off the steady state solution and what we are left with is two sine of x sine of two y plus three sine of four x sine of five y. And this is exactly what we got in example 1a. So as before, solving the related homogeneous equation is basically it's just doing a change of variables where we subtract off the steady state solution. So finally, what the, the picture of this is that, a kind of a crude picture, a little cartoon, is that the 
This is example 1b. This is example, the solution to example 1b. This is equal to the steady state solution, this, plus the solution with homogeneous boundary conditions. This is lecture 7.1, and this is example 1a. The remainder of this lecture will be focused on the wave equation. Here's the setup. Consider a vibrating square membrane of length L. Maybe you don't want to think of a membrane, you can think of a trampoline that you might see in a gymnasium. So something like this. And it also doesn't have to be square. It works just as well if it's rectangular. Or as we'll see in a later lecture, we'll do this um, in polar coordinates when we have a vibrating drum. The edges are held fixed. So if this is a trampoline, then the edges are not moving. And u of x, y, t represents the vertical displacement at some point in position x, y at time t. Then u satisfies the following boundary and initial value problem for the wave equation. So first is the wave equation, u, t, t equals c squared Laplacian of u. This is just physics. Now we have these four boundary conditions saying that the sides are all held fixed. And u of x, y, 0 is some initial displacement. That's a function h1 of x and y. And then the initial velocity is ut of x, y, 0 is some other function h2. So maybe the initial displacement is 0, and then um, the initial velocity at time 0, maybe a kid jumps on this, and so it goes down. Or maybe uh, this is a membrane, you're pulling it down, a piece of rubber, and then you're letting go. So you have two time derivatives. You need two initial conditions. Unlike the wave equation, you had one time derivative. So think of this as one of those ball problems that you saw in calculus. Remember where you had x double prime equals negative 9.8. And then you needed, so you're dropping a ball from a roof and you need to know, maybe here's the roof, there's the ground. You need to know two things. You need to know the initial position and the initial velocity. Are you throwing the ball upwards? Are you throwing it downwards? Or are you just letting it go? Similarly, you need the initial displacement here and the initial velocity. Think of this as the two-dimensional version of dropping a ball from the roof, or maybe maybe a better a mass spring system, because every point here is going to be vibrating up and down, up and down, up and down. Not surprisingly, it's, it's going to involve sine and cosine waves. And so we will solve it next. Here's what we're going to solve the following initial and boundary value problem for the wave equation. So again, this is the wave equation. These are the four zero boundary conditions, the homogeneous ones. We, our initial condition is, is this function. I'll say what this looks like in a moment. And the initial velocity is zero. Okay, so we have this trampoline. And now what, what does this look like? Well, the, this is a parabola in both the x direction and, and the y direction. So let's just say this is x and this is y. So that is going to look like, I don't know how well I can draw it. So something like that. And yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's I don't think it's technically a parabola, paraboloid. It's, it's parabola or paraboloid-ish. Okay, let's solve this. I'm not going to go through every detail like I did before, because a lot of them are the same, but we will assume that u of x, y, t equals a function of position, f of x, y, times a function of time. So when we, when we plug this back in, I'm gonna, we've done this before, I'm going to skip steps. Um, u, t, t is f, g, double prime, and this is c squared Laplacian of u. So that's equal to c squared Laplacian of f times g. So we're going to divide through by c squared fg over here and c squared fg over here. And again, the f's cancel on the left-hand side and the c squareds and the g's cancel on the right-hand side. And what we get is g double prime over c squared g equals Laplacian of f 
over f, and that's equal to a constant. Let's call it negative lambda, because again, this depends only on time, and it's equal to something that depends only on position. Okay, so these four boundary conditions, as before, are going to tell us that f of x0 equals f of 0y equals f of x pi equals, well, I ran out of room here, f of pi x equals 0. So, so we have two ODE, or we have an ODE and a PDE. So this eigenvalue equation, let's write down what we get. So we get the exact same thing for f. And that, that should not make, uh, that should not surprise you. Because nothing in, in uh, the spatial variables have, has changed. The only difference is that we have an extra time derivative here. So if anything's going to change, and it will, it'll be in the time variable. Okay, so we, we have f of x0 equals f of 0y equals f of x pi equals f of pi x equals zero. Same PDE, this is a Helmholtz equation with Dirichlet conditions. And now for g, we have g double prime equals negative lam oh, lambda squared, c squared lambda, c squared lambda times g. Okay, so several things. First of all, we know that lambda uh, is gonna be equal to for every m and every n, there's a lambda, which is m squared plus n squared, and f m n of x y equals, the eigenfunctions are sine of n x, sine of, sorry, m x, sine of, it doesn't matter, sine of n y. Okay, now for g. First of all, we can plug this back in and write this as negative c squared m squared plus n squared times g. And one more thing, we have these zero boundary conditions. And here we actually have a zero initial condition. We don't always have that. It's possible that the initial displacement and the initial velocity are non-zero. But in the event when we have one of these being zero, let's use this. This tells us that f of x, y times g prime of zero equals zero. Do you see why? Because ut equals f times g prime. Okay, so this tells us that g prime of zero equals zero. So let me underline that with red because I've done my, all my boundary conditions with red. Okay, so we also have that g prime of zero equals zero. So this is this is what we have for f and g. And this is, these are our solutions. Well, let me write down what g is. Okay, so what is, so what is g? You know, I'm gonna, I'll box this right now because g might take up a couple more lines. So when you look at this equation, what should be jumping out at you is sines and cosines. g double prime equals negative. This is my, this is, think of this as omega squared. So g, g of m n of t equals, now I don't like to put constants in front of these because we'll put them in front later, but I need to because I have a cosine and b sine. So I'm gonna write this as a m n cosine of the square root of this thing. That's omega squared, so that's c times so that's cosine of c times the square root of m squared plus n squared times t plus b m n times sine of c times m squared plus n squared t. So that's g, but we have this initial zero initial condition here. So let's Let's do that. Let's take the derivative and plug in zero. Now, I think, you know, we're all adults now. We don't need to, I'm not gonna take the derivative of this and then plug in zero. I'll do it all at once. So let's, 
let's do this together, talk it through. What is g m n prime of t? What happens? So you get, or of, of, of zero, that's what I meant to say, of zero. So, so what happens? You have, I'll do part of it. So you, you have a m n, and then you have the constant will come out, c times the square root, I don't even need to write m squared plus n squared, times, oh sure, it's, it's not hard, uh, times sine of, I'm just gonna do, well, we have zero, so I'm just gonna write sine of zero, that's easy. Oh, and it don't, doesn't matter, but we need a negative sign there. And then plus b m n times c times m squared plus n squared times cosine of zero. And this of course is zero, and this thing here is one. So that means that g prime of m n of zero equals b m n times c times m squared plus n squared equals zero. Well, c is non-zero, and m squared plus n squared is non-zero, so we conclude right away that b m n is equal to zero. So in other words, the sign term goes away. And so because of that, I don't really need to write this, this a m n. Um, we, I'm now gonna write up, up here that g m n of t equals cosine of c times m squared plus n squared times t. If you're worried that I'm dropping this constant, don't worry, it's coming back. Okay, so there we go. Now for each um, m and n, now do these things have to be bigger than, or is, is zero, what happens if, if these are zero? Well, if m or n is zero, either one of them, then f is zero, so the whole thing is gonna be zero. So let's say the, these are at least one. We have a solution u, m, n of x, y, t, which is f, m, n of x, y times g, m, n of t. And so that's this sine of mx, sine of ny times cosine of that. So the, the general solution So what's, okay, so what's the general solution here? This is gonna be u of x, y, t equals the sum for all m and n, at least one, of b, m, n. I don't know, do we wanna call it b, m, n or a, n, n? We have a sine and cosine here, whatever. Let's call it b. And, and then what? So we have sine of m x times sine of n y times cosine of c m squared plus n squared t. Okay, so that is the general solution. How does this compare to the heat equation? So the the heat equation, this cosine term was e to the minus c squared m squared plus n squared t for, for the heat equation. And why is that? So this ODE and G, instead of being sines and cosines with two derivatives, there was one derivative, it was an exponential function. That came from the fact that there's one time derivative here instead of two. That's one thing to notice. And other thing to notice, what if I had switched this? So instead of my trampoline starting off with this and letting it go, initial uh, vertical displacement being zero, what if I had started with a flat trampoline and jumped on it or punched it up, upwards? So suppose my initial 
velocity were this thing and my initial position were zero, what would have happened? Well, instead of g prime being zero, we would have had g being zero. And instead of killing off the sine term, we would have killed off the cosine term. So this cosine would have been a sine. Okay, I've run out of room. So on the next slide, I will summarize what we have done before. I will write the general solution. And then all we have to do is plug in the initial condition and figure out how to set it equal to that. Here's what we've done so far. We found the general solution to this initial and boundary value problem for the wave equation. And that's right here. I've written it here as a double sum. Okay, so now let's, let's plug in the initial condition. So let's plug in t equals zero. Okay, u of x, y, zero, what happens? So the, this is unchanged. The cosine term goes to, goes to one because cosine of zero is one. So we get this, I'm gonna write this as a double sum now just because that's what I did above. It, again, it really doesn't matter. So this is bmn sine of mx sine of ny. Now, what is this? I claim that this thing here, we can write as a product of Fourier series. So say m equals one up to infinity of, now what do I wanna call my coefficients? How about this one I'll do capital BM sine of mx times n equals one to infinity of, let's call this beta n sine of n y. Okay, so why are these things equal? Let's just think about what this is. So, so what is this thing on the left-hand side? The left-hand side here is, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be b11 sine of x sine of y plus b12 sine of x sine of 2y plus et cetera plus b21 sine of 2x sine of y plus b22 sine of 2x sine of 2y plus etc. And in the end, we're gonna get a b m n sine of m x sine of n y for every single pair m n n. That's what this is, it's this doubly infinite sum. What is this thing on the right here? This thing on the right is, is equal to, well, for, I, for every m and every n, there's going to be a, in this case, a b1 beta 1 sine of x sine of y plus b1 beta 2 sine of x sine of 2y plus dot dot dot. See where I'm going with this? b2 beta 1 sine of 2x sine of y plus b2 beta 2 sine of 2x sine of 2y. It's exactly the same thing. For every, for every m and every n, we're going to have a, a sine of mx sine of ny term, which is the coefficient here is going to be capital B M beta N. So th this is just two different ways to write this, this double Fourier series thing is really just the product of two Fourier series. And this thing here, I have to set this equal to X times pi minus X times Y times pi minus Y. So how do I write these, so I have to write this in a, these, both of these in a Fourier series. So I have to set these things equal and these things equal. And we know how to do that. We know that in this case, BM is equal to four times one minus negative one to the M over pi M cubed. And we know that beta N is equal to four times one minus negative one to the n 
over, oops, I put my parentheses in the wrong place. Oh no, that's right. I had it right originally over pi n cubed. So we're, and hey, look, we know that bmn, I mean, this b11 term is equal to b1 beta 1. This b21 is equal to b2 beta 2. The coefficients have to be the same. So we know that beta mn is equal to this product right there. So let's, let's write that down here. Um, I don't know what else I need to say about this. Um, we know that BMN is equal. So well, what do we have to do? To, to use the initial condition, all we have to do is figure out what BMN is. And we just did that. It's this times that. That is all. So BMN is is equal to, well, let's, let's multiply these together and see how it simplifies. So, so we get a 16 on top. We get a one minus negative one to the N. We get a one or M and a one minus negative one to the N. And then on the bottom, we get a pi and a pi. So we get pi squared, M squared, or M cubed, N cubed. And, and notice that this is going to be zero if either one of these two terms are zero. So if m is even or n is even, um, then, wait, even or odd. So hold on. If, if, so this is going to be zero when? This is going to be zero if, if that is zero or that is zero. And th this is going to be zero if m is even. So if, if m is even, or n is even, and that's going to be zero. Otherwise, both of these are going to be two. So if, if otherwise we get 16 times two times two, which is 64 over pi squared m cubed n cubed. And this is if both m and n are odd. So that's that's what this looks like. Um, if you want, I mean, if you wanted to, we we could stick this. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could, you could rewrite this double sum, stick that into here. I'm not going to do that. I think we have all the pieces here. Um, finally, what this looks like. Let me finish with a drawing. So this again looks like a little trampoline or a membrane where you are starting out with this little bubble. And what's the limit of this as t goes infinity? There is none, because this thing is going to propagate to get forever. It's going to bounce back and forth. So let me finish by saying that the limit of this as t goes to infinity of u of x, y, t does not exist. Okay, that is a good place to finish this lecture. What we will be doing next is everything we've done is in Cartesian coordinates. There's a lot of natural things in polar coordinates. And if we have time, cylindrical and spherical coordinates, especially spherical, that gets really messy really quickly. And the first thing to do is to rewrite um, Laplace's equation in polar coordinates. And it'll be harder. And we, But we will get the Bessel functions as eigenfunctions. In spherical coordinates, we will get the Legendre polynomials as eigenfunctions. Remember those? So that's what's coming up next. Uh, it's, it's, it's really useful because I think a vibrating drum is probably more common than a vibrating square membrane. Okay, so that's coming up next. Stay with us.